Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, in today's endgame video I'm going to cover king and two pawns versus king, which is probably the easiest uh, lecture we are going to be looking at because it's almost always winning. There are some exceptions as we are going to see. But we are going to look, be looking at uh, two rules which are very important to, to, to remember and once you know them every two pawn versus king ending is going to be easily winning for you. The first thing I would like to go over is that uh, past pawns, protected past pawns, when you have two connected pawns uh, which are uh, attacked by your opponent's king, they are completely immune. Uh, the, the black king in this case can never take the pawn. And once he takes the d3 pawn in this case, the c4 pawn is going to be marching up the board. So if you have two pawns versus your opponent's king, you don't need to rush your, your king towards this side, let's say your king goes here. The black king can never take on d3 because once it does, if you remember the rule of the square, the king has just exited the square of the c4 pawn, which means that the pawn is going to be queening. If you don't remember the basic rules, such as the opposition or the rule of the square of the, or, the, or the critical squares for queening pawns, you should watch the first video in the series, the video on the opposition, where I went over the basics. But here you can see, as soon as the black king took the d3 pawn, uh, the c4 pawn is outside of its reach because the king is no longer in the square, and now c5 is going to be simply winning. The black king can never catch it. And this can be applied to any single position where you have connected pawns uh, and the black king is never going to be able to take them. So this much is clear. A bit finesse comes in handy uh, when you have two pawns versus the king, which are apart, which are not connected. And we are going to be looking at three different positions, pawns which are one square apart, pawns which are going to be two squares apart, and pawns which are going to be three squares apart, and there's, there's going to be a difference. There's one key rule that you need to remember about this, which applies to all of them, and that's the rule of the common square, which has been established in the first half of the 20th century, and it's been a part of chess theory ever since then, so almost 100 years. And the rule of the common square states then that once you draw a square around your pawns, in this case, this is going to be a square with the corners on b5, d5, b7, and d7. So draw a perfect square using two of your pawns as, as its corners, and then uh, make the mirror image of the pawns on the other side. Uh, the rule of the common square states that if the common square comprises the queening rank, or in this case the eighth rank, then the pawns do not require the, the support of the king. So in this case, since these two pawns don't have a common square which comprises or touches the 8th rank, they need the support of their king to win. That means that the white king is at some point going to have to help his pawns to queen. That's one thing. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the pawns which are one square apart, in this case, the same position that we had uh, as in the last example, if their common square comprises the 8th rank, they simply don't need the help of the king. And these uh, positions are going to be the most easily winning. In this case, white can simply play the move f7, and you can see that the black king can never take the d6 pawn. It cannot approach uh, via e7 or via e8. Its best move is probably to play e6, and then white simply queens. This position is winning. So the rule of the common square is extremely important. If you know that rule, then it's going to be simple to apply it to any single king and pawn ending. It doesn't have to be king and one pawn, it doesn't have to be king and two pawns. It could be king and three versus king and three, but this rule is going to be extremely important because you are going to be able to anticipate the following ending. So once again, uh, in some positions, you're going to be giving up one of your pawns uh, and you need to remember the rule of the square, which we saw in the first video. So if the opponent's king is outside of your pawn's square or is unable to reach it on its following move, if it's black to play, then the pawn can queen. So this has to be applied. Uh, one thing that has to be mentioned here is that regardless of how far the white king is, if we look at this position, for example, you can see that the pawns, which are one square apart, do not have a common square which comprises the 8th rank, which means that they cannot queen on their own. White still doesn't have to rush. Why doesn't white have to rush? Because the black king can never take both pawns. Uh, the white king has to support the pawns to win, but the black king can never take them at his own leisure because, because one of the pawns is going to queen. And let's see that, that now. So since the black king is threatening to take the c5 pawn, the only thing white has to do is march his other pawn closer up the board, so in this case e6, and you can see that if the black king ever takes c5, it's going to be outside of the square uh, 
of in this case the e6 pawn so if black takes on c5 white is going to play e7 so the only move black can play to stay in the game is the move c7 since d6 is taken d7 is taken he needs to play the move c7 in order to be able to stay in the square of the e6 pawn and that means that black is sort of in a limbo he can never win the pawns he's just basically waiting to lose so regardless how far the white king is he's going to have enough time to march up the board support the pawns and win the game because the black king can never take them so let's say black just repeats the moves because he's, he has nothing better to do white marches up the board still the black king can never take on c5 once the king moves now you are forcing the king to move and now you can simply win the game it's it's easily winning and white wins the game so the rule of the common square is the first thing you need to remember it's uh, not tricky with uh, regardless of how many squares are uh, are in between the two pawns but the situation changes as we are going to see so this position was clear uh, I'm sorry. So once again, if the common square comprises the 8th rank or the queening rank, then it's easily winning. You don't need your king. If it doesn't comprise the queening rank, you still have time to march your king up the board and win the game. Uh, the situation changes a bit when the pawns are two squares apart, as we are going to see in this position, uh, their queening square comprises the 8th rank, which means that the pawns are easily winning, the black king can never take, and they don't need the support of the white king, so white can now just play the move f6. Let's say black plays king to d7, which is the most uh, resilient move, c6 check. You can see that if the black, the black king ever captures the c6 pawn, it's going to be outside, of the queening square uh, of, of the of the f6 pawn so if uh, the king takes on c6 f7 is easily winning but let's look at a more complex example where uh, the black king uh, sort of is controlling both pawns visually and now we need that the po now we know that the pawns require the support of the white king but we also know that the black king doesn't have time to capture them the best thing it can get is taking one pawn and then white is going to win by achieving simple opposition as we are going to see so let's say king d2 uh, in this position both moves uh, win both c4 and f4 because uh, the black king is going to have to march take one pawn and then uh, and then white is going to be able to hurt the other up the board so let's say you play the engine move you play the absolute best move to win fastest which is more complicated so i would recommend it but just to prove the theory so c4 and king takes c4 as soon as the king takes on c4 then king e2 and you can see that the white king is in front of the pawn and if you remember the the lecture on the opposition and the lecture on king and one pawn versus king if you haven't seen them see them this is easily winning for white so in the case of uh, of uh, pawns being two files apart uh, the black king can still do nothing the only thing you need to remember is that if their common square doesn't comprise the eighth rank or the queening rank if it's not touching the 8th rank, then your king is going to have to help them to win eventually. So let's say you play king d2, which makes visually most sense. Uh, king e5. Now we can play the move c4. And you, you see that as soon as uh, the black king approaches one pawn, you can sacrifice one pawn, you can get that more complex position. But let's say you don't play c4, you simply march your king up the board because you want to have a clean win. So let's say f4 here, not giving the black king any options. Uh, king e6, king e4 let's say king d6, you can now play c4. And now you have the position where the, the pawns are actually soon going to have a common square which comprises the 8th rank and are going to be winning without the king's support. Uh, the third position is when, uh, I'm sorry, when the pawns are three files apart. When the pawns are three files apart, it's important to understand that uh, the black king cannot even attack them. So as soon as the black king starts marching towards one pawn, so let's say white plays nothing, let's say king d4, let's say white play, plays nothing. As soon as the black king plays c, king c3 in this position, he doesn't even have time to take the pawn. As soon as the f pawn marches up the board, as we are going to see, now if you draw the, the, the square, the queening square around the f4 uh, pawn, you can see that if the black king captures on b3, the, the pawn is going to march up the board. So in fact, once f4 is played, the black king has to go back via king d4, and now white can just continue. So pawns which are three or more squares apart, of course, if there are, if there are six squares apart, then you don't even have to consider anything, just push the pawns if there are... Uh, four, po four squares apart, it's easily winning. So three squares apart or more is easily winning. You don't have to think about anything. Now, the only position that requires some finesse 
is uh, the position where you have doubled pawns. And this is actually what most commonly happens uh, in, in practice. So this position, uh, you need to know a position, you need to know the rule of the square. And you need to know the rule of the critical squares. So in, in this position, the C2 pawn has three critical squares. Those squares are B4, C4, and D4. And the C4 pawn has three critical squares. Those squares are B6, C6, and D6. So if the white king manages to reach any single of these three critical squares, so d6, c6, or b6, he's going to be winning. And the situation is very easy if you, if you have a reserve move. I've talked about it in the video on the opposition and the video on the king and pawn. So let's say the position continues like this. In this position, you always have the reserve move c3, which is going to force you to gain the opposition. So let's say in this case, you don't have uh, an improvement in your position. Well, in this case, you do. You can just play c3 and force the black king away. So you immediately have, uh, have a better position. But here, the black king has the opposition. If the black king now plays the move uh, b6, now black has the opposition. So if this pawn weren't here, this would in fact be a draw. But now you can play the move c3 and win easily. So it's important to know Opposition, the rule of the square, and the rule of the critical squares. In a more complicated position where the pawns are uh, immediately uh, one next to each other on the same file, so you don't have a reserve move, this position is going to require some finesse, and these positions can in fact be drawing sometimes. Of course, uh, if the black king were on c4 and the white king were on h1, black would just mop up the pawns. So this is going to require some crude calculation. You're going to have to go, okay, the black kings go here, I go here, he goes here, I go here. And if you're not losing both pawns immediately, once again, opposition, the rule of the square and the critical squares are going to be vital. So in this position, white is, of course, winning uh, king f3 because he is near, en near enough. King c6, king e4, let's say king b5, uh, which is the most resilient move, king d4. And now you can see that uh, white is going to be able to play, uh, to play his tempo move. And once uh, white, let's say black, goes here, as soon as white play, plays the move c4, he's going to have his reserve move. So even if the two pawns are immediately next to each other on the same file, if your king is uh, close enough, then you are going to be able to move the first pawn and give yourself the tempo move. So it's always going to be winning. So in conclusion, uh, king and two pawns versus king is always winning, always winning unless you have doubled pawns and your opponent's king is much closer and can win bo both pawns or win one pawn and gain the opposition. So this is the only case where you are going to have to calculate uh, uh, the exact variations. Okay, uh, I hope this lesson was helpful. Uh, I know it's uh, pretty simple, but I think it's important to know the rule of the common square because it's going to make your calculation in the end game much easier. You're going to reduce the chance of blundering because after five hours of playing, even two pawns versus king uh, can be messed up if you really mess it up. And uh, yeah, I hope this helps. Hope you found it useful. Please let me know what you think. Uh, I, I would appreciate any feedback and uh, stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yeah, 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 yeah.